Good morning, friends. First of all, allow me to thank you for the comments you made following yesterday's address. I found all of them helpful and stimulating. Some of you even anticipated places that I'm going to be going in subsequent lectures, which is encouraging to me. I propose that we, for the, today and the rest of the week, follow the same procedure. Um, when I finish my remarks, I will get out of the way and allow you to continue the conversation. Uh, so I welcome all of your ideas and elaborations and concerns and disagreements. All are most welcome. In the first lecture, I examined the relationship of Jesus to the law and thus to Judaism. In this second lecture, I want to examine the relationship between Quakerism and Christianity and will suggest that as Jesus is to Judaism, so Quakerism is to Christianity. As Jesus criticizes Jewish formalism, so Quakerism is a criticism of Christian formalism. The antagonists have changed names. Quakers take on hireling ministers and religious professors, that is, those who profess the faith, rather than scribes and Pharisees. But the structure of the two conflicts contains remarkable parallels. I should admit at the outset that not only is the story I am telling here being staged, that is, presented in a way to highlight certain aspects for specific purposes and allowing others to recede into background horizons, but that the stories upon which I am basing my story were to some large extent staged as well. I attended a lecture by a Jewish scholar friend of mine some years ago in which he opened up for the audience some Talmudic texts and bedazzled us with the insight and wisdom of the rabbis whose discussions they record. At the end of the talk, he turned to his mostly Christian audience and said of these admirable rabbis, by the way, most of you would call them Pharisees. In my first lecture, I worked to show that the Pharisees were not the one-dimensional legalists they are sometimes pictured as in the Christian scriptures, and that Jesus' relationship to them and the law they championed cannot be reduced to one of simple opposition. Though critical of them, he was as much with them as against them, as I have claimed, or as I have claimed, against them in order to be with them. The polemics, that is, confrontation, of early Quakerism with respect to the Christianity of its day can be understood as similarly staged. Quaker scholars are, for the greater part, now convinced that what has come to be known as the Barber Nuttall thesis, that early Quakerism is best thought of as a radical form of Puritanism, has won the day over against the thesis of Rufus Jones that early Quakerism was a species of mysticism. That is, the Quaker arguments with the Christians of their day, like the arguments between Jesus and the Pharisees, were a family affair. And indeed, the viciousness of the broadsides issuing from both sides had all of the marks of a family feud. Quakers sought not to reject Christianity, but to call it to faithfulness to fulfill it. That is, I am drawing here a parallel. As Jesus sought to fulfill the law, which was with respect to the law neither an unquestioning and uncritical adherence, nor a disdainful rejection or neglect, so Quakerism can fruitfully be thought, or so I am proposing, as a fulfillment of Christianity. As Jesus plunged deeply into the foundations of Judaism to call Judaism to be true to itself, so early friends sought to revive primitive Christianity in an attempt to call the church to faithfulness, to call it back to the light that had been eclipsed 
by the religious conventions of men. And where Jesus saw the fulfillment of the law necessitated the violation of any and all particular laws, however valid, insofar as they were lived outside of the spirit of the law, friends recognized that faithfulness to Christianity required going beyond any particular formation of it, even their own. That is, I am trying to think here differently, beyond the polarized choices of either unqualified affirmation or outright surpassing one of the most perplexing and contentious issues plaguing contemporary Quakerism, the relationship of Quakerism to Christianity. So what is the problem? When I was a boy growing up in the world of evangelical friends, I often had quoted to me and was made to memorize the scripture, be not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This charge was often supplemented in a not so subtly coercive move by a saying of Jesus. Everyone therefore who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. The clear implication was that, on pain of my salvation, I was to boldly and fearlessly confess my Christianity. And thought experiments were conjured up to make this point. If a group of men came bursting into the meeting with guns, threatening to kill all Christians, would we have the courage to confess our Lord? Well, the men with guns never came. But that doesn't mean that my willingness to confess Christianity hasn't been put to the test. Indeed, it has. Frankly, over the years, it has become harder and harder to admit to being a Christian for very many of us, even for those of us who still long to do so. But that is not because we are ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but because we are ashamed of what all has been perpetuated in the name of that gospel. The Quaker historian Thomas Ham quotes an unidentified universalist friend as saying, the patriarchal Judeo-Christian tradition subjugated women, contributed to the imperialistic destruction of indigenous cultures, and fostered violence down to the present day. And given that it is the source of pogroms, racism, sexism, slavery, colonialism, homophobia, oppression of the poor, and degradation of the environment, it is not surprising to ask with another, how can others claim to be Quaker and live a spiritual life devoted to such a Christ of constriction and oppression. Tom Ham points out this is an extreme statement even among universalist friends. Indeed, Christianity has also, as often, provided an impetus to positive social change and hospice and grace to those most in need. But in our clearer moments, how can we not admit that these friends have a legitimate concern. How could anyone with any kind of commitment to the way of the gospel, the way of love, peace, justice, equality, want to affirm any association with that? Christianity has indeed become so sullied, so polluted by its implication in oppressive power structures and the names so monopolized by those who wish to benefit by enforcing them, whether sincerely or cynically, that it is hard to not be ashamed to be a Christian. And many of us quite understandably and quite justifiably run from that as from the plague it has so often become. In a recent conversation I had with a thoughtful and sensitive friend's pastor, he confessed to me that he thought that in America today, it was perhaps impossible to be a pastor and a Christian, at least a true Christian, 
that is impossible to be among those enforcing the power structures in which Christianity has participated and which it has perpetuated, if not initiated, and yet live the grace of the gospel. He was seeing exactly the same thing as the friends quoted above who were antagonistic to Christianity, even if his reaction is to try and redeem rather than jettison Christianity. If we are committed to gospel values, and it has been my consistent experience that all friends of every variety are, although they are in each case refracted through different lenses and therefore have different concrete manifestations, but if we are committed to gospel values, we have this fundamental choice to make. Do we call ourselves Christians for Christ's sake? and attempt to reclaim the institution of Christianity over against those who would pervert it? Or do we see Christianity as so corrupt that the only way of preserving these values is to reject Christianity and the name Christ too that is inextricably bound up with it, rebrand these values, universal and human values, and happily let the whole Christian thing just go away? Is Christianity itself redeemable or irredeemable? Evangelical and Orthodox friends tend toward the first option, though many quite uncomfortably, and more liberal friends tend toward the second option, though most do not follow this road all the way to the end. I don't think there is an easy or straightforward answer to this question. I confess to going back and forth on it myself. It is important for me to call myself a Christian, but given what all has been wrought under the auspices of this name, I kind of hate myself every time I do. This ambivalence about the institution, about the fixing of living faith in forms, is anything but the sole provenance of our generation, however. It is in terms of Christian history as old as its inspirational figure, Jesus, as I attempted to show in the first lecture, and prior even to that as old as the Hebrew prophets, who called into question the cultic formalities of the Israelites in the name of something deeper. Thus Hosea, speaking for God, declares, I want you to be merciful. I don't want your sacrifices. I want you to know God. That's more important than burnt offerings. Isaiah is even harsher. I am sick of your sacrifices, says the Lord. Don't bring me any more burnt offerings. I don't want the fat of your rams or other animals. I don't want to see the blood from your offerings of bulls and goats. Why do you keep parading through my courts with your worthless sacrifices? The incense you bring me is a stench in my nostrils. Your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath day and your special days for fasting, even your most pious meetings, are all sinful and false. The early Christian writings set up a series of contrasts to name this distinction between the living and the dead. So we read, for instance, that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But even more deeply and performatively, we are presented in the image that anchors the whole of Christian faith with the idea that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the way it's put in the Gospel of John, once known as the Quaker Gospel for the weight Quakers put upon it as the source of their own articulations. The same chapter significantly adds, and the world did not recognize him, setting up another contrast, this time between the kingdom of God and the world. The idea here is that the followers of Jesus are not to replace one set of dead forms with another set of dead forms, but rather are to be alive. The living spirit of Christ, the word, is irreducible to mere words, goes beyond the forms recognizable in the world. 
always exceeds the words in which it is articulated and the forms that it takes. The living word, the Christ, becomes flesh, finds concrete form in the world, but is not of this world, and his followers are therefore instructed in a now common phrase that is a remarkable distillation of biblical teaching, though not found in the Bible itself, to likewise be in the world, but not of the world. In each case, there seems to be the life on the one hand, and the form that that life takes on the other. And the form that the life takes is never to be mistaken for the life itself. But that life on the Christian conception does take definitive form in the world, in the world, namely in the figure, figure of Jesus the Christ, the very word become flesh. The way of life preached and modeled by Jesus is not just anything at all. It has bite in the world. It calls Christians to live in this way rather than that. In a remarkable series of everyday and earthy illustrations that we know as parables, Jesus lays out the vision of this alternative way, which he refers to as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, or like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, or like a treasure hidden in a field. We contemporary folk often balk at the language of kingdom, thinking it not only old-fashioned, but perpetuating an oppressive hierarchical mindset that we strive to leave behind. But it was a favorite term among early Quakers. This is in part because Quakers were not opposed to hierarchy, only hierarchy among human beings. God was for them king. We were to be guided by God, not negotiate with God as an equal. But it was also because they recognized that the kingdom of heaven spoken of by Jesus was not an alternative kingdom, but a subversive kingdom. The term kingdom Basilus in Greek, in the Christian scriptures is a rhetorical device. It gives us the outline of a kingdom that isn't one. For those with ears to hear, as the Bible puts it, this is really quite humorous. A kingdom that isn't one. What kind of kingdom is that? This confused Jesus' followers at times, who didn't always get it. Disappointed the zealots who aspired to armed insurrection, and certainly confused the Roman authorities who saw it as a potential military threat, with the obvious results. Jesus' envisioned kingdom was subversive, but not in the sense of setting up a kingdom that would take on the kingdoms of the world head to head, battling it out with them for supremacy on their own terms but undermining the very idea of kingdoms as the world understood them. It was a kingdom whose weapons were peace, whose justice was forgiveness, and whose economy was grace. And while Constantine in the fourth century and a long, steady line of others since sought to wed the kingdom of God to the kingdoms of this world, the ultimate power couple, There has always been a smattering of God's people, sometimes referred to as a faithful remnant, who desired this other kingdom and have often withdrawn from the world in an attempt to find it. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus says, but it is not otherworldly in the sense of irrelevant for the world. Christians were and are called to live it out, to realize it, to make it a reality, to give the kingdom concrete form. For Christians, Jesus preaches and lives that reality, is the form that the kingdom is to take in the world. But that is not the end of the story. Upon his departure from this world, Jesus promises to send the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, as advocate or counselor, to continue to guide his followers in realizing the kingdom that isn't one. 
Asking what would Jesus do might be a good start, but it's not the end of the conversation. What is the spirit of Christ leading us to do here, now, today, in this place, in the light of our present circumstances, is a question at least as important. Christianity inhabits the tension that is set up between Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God is already among you and his teaching his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Though grounded in and oriented by the form that the kingdom takes in the life of Christ, for Christians it is the living spirit of Christ that animates and exceeds any form that Christian life takes. Christian life is only true to itself when it exceeds the forms that it takes in the world, even if to be realized it must take form in the world. The forms of Christian life are a response to the call of the gospel, the call to realize the kingdom, and so must take on some manifestation or other, but no manifestation is equivalent to the call to the kingdom itself, which always exceeds such responses and refuses to allow them to settle into final formulations. And that's why even the Apostle Paul, considered by many liberal theologians to be the enemy, the guy who ruined the beautiful Jesus thing by instituting Christianity, is rather more complex. If out of one side of his mouth, Paul is full of prescriptions, telling women to stay silent in church, advising deacons on their sexual practices, counseling slaves to obey their masters. Out of the other side of his mouth, he is preaching freedom, breaking down the power relations between male and female, Jew and Greek, slave and free man, and inviting the followers of Christ to work out their own salvation in fear and trembling. That is not the blatant and obvious contradiction it seems to be, and is not so far off what we find in early Quakers either. Indeed, Quakerism <clears throat> was born of a disillusionment with the forms that Christianity had taken in the mid-17th century and the experience of the life they had obscured. When all my hopes in them, that is, in priests and preachers, esteemed and experienced people, and in all men were gone, so that I had nothing outwardly to help me, nor could I tell what to do, George Fox bemoans before exalting, then, oh then, I heard a voice which said, there is one, even Christ Jesus, that can speak to thy condition. And when I heard it, my heart did leap for joy. The language that Fox and other early friends found to express this concern was that of a contrast between inner and outer. This metaphor was not meant to communicate topographical facts, was not meant to suggest that Christ was literally inside of them as opposed to outside of them, although the detractors of Quakerism often took it that way, hearing in the Quaker affirmation of the Christ within a denial of the historical Christ, and a few Quakers heard it that way too, though neither the majority nor most of the principal publishers of truth. Preaching Christ as inside rather than outside could become a dead formality as easily as the reverse. Rather, this language was meant to capture the contrast between the living, breathing presence of God in their lives that caused them to quake, that convicted them and transformed them from the inside out, as it were, and the fixed forms out there that lacked such power. And this suspicion of forms continues to animate us Quakers today. While remaining suspicious of forms outside of the life, already in the first decade, Quakers also recognized the need to give form to that life in the world, and they began to organize the people of God, which they did not hesitate to refer to as the church, and to articulate, that is, give form to, the Quaker experience. This did not sit well with all. 
Some immediately feared the return of the forms from which they had lived their Quaker experience as an emancipation. Some, like Perrault and his party, not only objected to the authority of the leading itinerant friends, but even objected to the setting of fixed times for meetings, arguing that friends should trust the spirit to lead them together at the time the spirit would appoint, not any human conventions. For good or ill, more practical heads prevailed. But the point is that the struggle between giving concrete expression to Quaker life, the prerequisite for the life of the body as a community, the prerequisite for realizing it, and the fear that those expressions would harden into the rigid structures against which Quakerism was itself a protest, was a deep concern among early friends, and remains so for us. One of the nicest examples of the attempt to negotiate these tricky waters is the letter to the Quaker communities in the North from the meeting of elders and brethren at Balby in Yorkshire in 1656, the oldest church advice on Christian practice issued by any general body of friends. After laying out a number of directives, referred to as necessary things in the title of the letter, that ranged from the arrangement and discipline of meetings to advice to ministers, to care for the poor, to domestic and vocational matters, to the relationship of friends to the state, the, later, the letter <clears throat> famously ends with the following postscript. Dearly beloved friends, these things we do not lay upon you as a rule or form to walk by, but that all with the measure of light which is pure and holy may be guided. And so in the light walking and abiding, these may be fulfilled in the spirit, not from the letter, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. These directives are to be followed, but not as rules or forms, but because they are necessary to the fulfilling of the spirit in those who do. The spirit requires forms, but is not stuck in them. The form of our own more recent Quaker books of faith and practice echoes and extends this pat pattern. In providing us with a series of evocative and inspirational quotations from significant periods and people in our tradition, rather than with a set of rules that Quakers must follow, we are presented not with a creed that dictates what Quakers must believe, but with an account of what Quakers have believed not with a rule book for what, for what Quakers must do, but with an understanding of what Quakers have done. But as we know, these reports on past experience are not insignificant to our ongoing Quaker life. Our investment in them is not antiquarian, but futural. They invite us to find ourselves in this heritage as a way of moving forth of moving into an unanticipated elsewhere. Like the letter from the elders at Balby of 350 years ago, they invite us to participate in the living spirit of Quaker faith in a concrete but non-definitive way. My suggestion is that we do well to understand early Quakerism, that is, the original impulse of the Quaker movement that opens up the space and provides both the inspiration and the parameters for the subsequent unfolding of the Quaker tradition, as reiterating at a radicalized level, as struggling with anew, the same dynamic tension between a living relationship with God and the necessary but potentially stultifying forms that we find in Jesus' encounter with the formalism of the Jewish law. That is, my suggestion is that we do well to understand early Quakerism as an attempt to fulfill Christianity. But it could only be an attempt at the fulfillment of Christianity because Christianity itself struggled with the same tension. Was itself such an attempt at fulfillment, though mostly a failed one on the Quaker reading, a struggle Christianity in its turn inherited 
from its progenitor, Judaism. It is, therefore, as much a perversion of Jesus to read him as either a wholesale adoption of Judaism or as a rejection of it, as it is a perversion of Quakerism to read it as either a wholesale adoption of Christianity or as an outright rejection of it. My proposal is that we do not understand Jesus' relationship to the law unless we get over the false choice between blind obedience and transgressive rejection, and begin to see this relationship aright as the one that the Christian scriptures refer to as fulfillment, which is precisely transgression for the sake of obedience, or an obedience that demands transgression. Just as Jesus saw himself not as a rejection of Judaism, but as its fulfillment, I am suggesting that we can only wait